All right. Well, we're going to change gears just a little bit here. Dr. Ben Wally is going to come up and tell you a little bit about organ transplantation and adult congenital heart disease. She's the associate professor uh, in cardiothoracic surgery. Please come up and share your knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. And uh, this vast topic of organ transplantation, uh, Jamil, I don't know where to start, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, um, always start to talk with um, giving credits to the people who started it. Dr. Shumway, his legacy will never be forgotten. The hard work that was done just 30, 40 years ago, and we um, are building on the uh, shoulders of these giants. Um, the indications for heart failure and uh, transplantation in heart failure patients are well known to everyone, so I won't go into it too much. Um, but in congenital heart disease, the most common indications are failed Fontan, and that's uh, where most of our patients come uh, fit into the category. Uh, there are certain contraindications, obesity. Um, we are changing our criteria as we, as we go. Again, advanced age is a contraindication. Unfortunately, most of our congenital patients don't reach the ripe old age of 73 to need a transplant, so um, we haven't struggled with that. And then, of course, multi-organ involvement. Um, we see a lot of complications of failed Fontan, such as uh, protein losing enteropathy, uh, liver cirrhosis, more importantly, and eventually uh, even renal failure. So uh, there is a limit on the number of organs that can be transplanted, and we uh, try to approach this um, in a sort of a preventative manner, trying to get to transplant before all the organs fail. Um, of the adult transplants, uh, you can see the yellow uh, square is congenital heart disease. It's a fraction of the total transplants being performed uh, across the, uh, the uh, world. And um, again, you can see the multi-organ transplantation also is a small uh, fraction of the total transplants. Uh, heart liver being more, uh, uh, heart kidney being more common than heart liver. And uh, then again, triple organ transplants are in a different category altogether. Um, not to bore you with too many slides, but again, uh, the yellow bar is congenital heart disease. You see the first 12 months are the hardest um, for uh, congen adult congenital patients after a transplant. Uh, this is because they still have lingering problems like the PLE, um, develop a little bit of ascites, have problems with fluid balance, and are in and out of hospital for the first 12 months. And I always warn our patients when they come in that this is not a slam dunk. You're gonna feel like, why did I go through this major operation and, and I'm still, I have swelling on my feet. So it takes a while because it took them 30, 40 years to get to transplant and a lot of systems are down. So uh, I always encourage them that the first 12 months may look bad, but after that, that the top of the, uh, you know, here we go, the yellow bar is top survivals up to 25 years as uh, looking at the other um, players who um, um, dwindle as uh, the years go by. And that, again, is because they're young. Uh, the median survival for our uh, congenital heart disease patients, um, as you can see in this, uh, is, is rivals all others. And um, this is why we uh, think that transplantation is an option when everything else fails and um, all our hybrid procedures um, don't result in, in uh, long-term um, relief of symptoms. Um, so here we go. Uh, transplant, again, itself is not the full solution uh, because our patients are young and our transplants, although they do last a while, uh, sometimes do go down. Um, tra Retransplantation is an option, but again, it's very difficult um, to al allocate an organ to the same individual um, following this. <laughs> Most of this is because of uh, <laughs> chronic organ rejection, and a lot of our work right now is being done in antibody-mediated rejection, uh, which is especially important in our adult congenital population because they're so highly sensitized. Uh, the homograph patches they've received as infants or the blood transfusions have uh, uh, increased their PRA so that when they do get a new organ, they um, develop uh, donor-specific antibodies and, and um, have earlier uh, rejection. So here we uh, are looking at 
um, the uh, causes of uh, leading causes of death in adult heart transplants. And uh, you can see that although acute rejection uh, is important, but uh, it's it's not the graft failure is the most important in uh, over the years for organ rejection. Um, I'm going to skip this, and this is a slide of one of our patients where you can see the uh, affection of the uh, coronaries in the transplanted heart. Um, this is uh, Dr. Fishbein, who's in the audience, has uh, classified this as coronary allograft vasculopathy because it's not just the arteries that get occluded, it's also the, the um, venous structure. So here you can see the whole left main trunk is completely occluded. Um, there's also microvascular disease. Um, I don't know why this is showing up like this, but this is uh, one of Dr. Fishbein's slides again, which shows that there's a pan arteritis, there's involvement, uh, it's, there's um, concentric uh, narrowing of the vessels, and it involves all layers of the vessel. I can see that here as well. And also you can see the coronary uh, veins uh, are affected too. So if you look at congenital heart disease, the yellow bar, again, they are, uh, the best in terms of freedom from coronary allograft vasculopathy. And uh, this is, uh, you, you know, data which is, you know, across all nations uh, and all centers. So if we get them through the first year, they do well, even in terms of developing re chronic rejection. And that is what stimulates us and um, excites us about these transplant patients. Um, again, if you look at renal dysfunction, prograph-induced uh, nephropathy, Congenital heart disease patients do much better than others who have ischemic heart disease or other uh, reasons why they got their transplant in the first place. So yes, it's very difficult to take care of these patients, but it's worth it in the end. Um, so the reconstruction at the time of, of fond I mean, the, this is the etiology of heart failure and congenital anomalies. Most of them are dealt with in infancy, but what we see mainly in adult congenital population are the failed fontans. Whether they fail because of AV val uh, atrioventricular valve regurgitation or they fail because of um, increased fontan pressures is irrelevant because eventually they come to the final common chopping block which is transplant. <laughs> the um, patients sometimes even have preserved ventricular function but just a failed fontan and that's something that my colleague Dr. Reardon is going to talk more about uh, in his talk about mechanical support. Um, so this is a patient of Dr. Lax, um, who, uh, who we operated on, who had arrhythmogenic right ventricle dysplasia. And uh, we had to excise the entire right ventricle wall and uh, replace it with a, a tissue substitute, which was a matrix, and um, allegedly was supposed to re be replaced by muscle. Um, however, a couple years later, um, the, um, the the putative replacement matrix had not turned into muscle, and uh, unfortunately, she had to be transplanted. So uh, some pretty radical work is done in order to uh, delay or preempt transplant, but unfortunately, um, the um, complexity of these patients makes it so that uh, these surgeries are not without risk. Um, so special, coming to the special considerations for a congenital defects, we have to talk about the surgical reconstruction. Obviously, if these are fontans, extra cardiac fontans, they have to be taken down at the time of surgery. Um, the pulmonary arteries uh, may need reconstruction because they may have stents in them, or the site where the fontan was plugged in needs to be repaired. Um, previous uh, sendings of musters, the entire baffle needs to be taken down uh, prior to uh, anastomosing the left atrium. Um, so our special worries are in patients with systemic anomalies. Let me go back to that. Um, hit back. Here we go. Um, systemic uh, IVC and SVC um, anomalies, which make the reconstruction difficult, um, are, are uh, the bane of our existence. In patients with heterotaxy or dextrocardia, we have to specially reconstruct them. Let's uh, move on to... Um, size. Now, usually we prefer to get oversized donors for these uh, recipients because uh, of the high blood volumes. Uh, Fontan patients who are failing have very high intravascular volumes, and this requires a very strong right ventricle to be able to uh, take over the task of dealing with this volume once the heart's transplanted. So we try to oversize them slightly. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to fit in a heart which was previously had a dextrocardic heart and you have now an orthotopic heart, it's difficult to close the chest and that may have to be addressed with uh, sternal reconstructions or uh, even uh, uh, costal resections. 
Um, these uh, patient, uh, adult congenital patients who have complex Fontan reconstructions may require an open chest uh, for a while, um, and the uh, systemic venous return baffle may sometimes be prone to kinking, and we have special ways of avoiding that. Um, of course, we need length on everything. <laughs> That's true to life. Um, and when, uh, let me just go back. When you uh, do the classical construction, when you do a heart transplant, this is how it looks. You have the four veins and the atrial cuff is plugged into the atrium. And very simplistic drawing here showing the SVC and IVC and asthmosis. But this is never the case in a congenital. There's so much blood in the field. The collaterals are so big that uh, Dr. Albuholson in the past has had to play, place uh, atrial septal defect occluders in some of them. And uh, there are horrendous um, uh, venovenous as well as arterial collaterals and ascites. Um, everything bleeds because the patient has cirrhosis or uh, has collaterals. And so it, these are very um, taxing intraoperatively to deal with. It's never as pretty as this. Um, Preoperative preparation is something really important for our complex Fontan um, patients coming for heart transplant. And um, diuresis has to be maintained so that you can decrease the intravascular volume. At the same time, you have to be very careful that they do not lose their renal function. And um, the other consideration is their um, uh, PRAs, they may require plasmapheresis prior to transplantation. Um, they may require intraoperative, uh, even before a skin incision, they may require uh, procoagulants, uh, FFP, and products um, to help them with their bleeding uh, issues. So this is a, a heart transplant program at UCLA. We've done 67 last year, um, and of them, about um, the adult congenital is um, about 3%, um, I would say, three to four percent, pediatric is about 10 percent, and uh, that's the rest of the population. Um, this is uh, one of our patients who had heterotaxy and uh, anomalous systemic venous connections, and had bilateral pulmonary artery stents, as you can see there. Um, this is a patient with an extra cardiac fontan. Um, you can see how we baffle the left SVC using a, a supported Gore-Tex conduit. So the, the baffle is coming off the left IVC, and then it's hooked up into the in, inferior vena cable and astronauts. And this is a technique that Dr. Lax has um, taught us over the years, it has worked really well, because the, the conduit sits nicely behind the heart. And because it's supported Gore-Tex, it doesn't get uh, compressed. At the same time, the anastomosis is large enough that there is no obstruction. Um, sometimes we can also baffle, do a retroaortic baffle. Um, but uh, I've seen that occluded more frequently than this uh, technique, where you bring the conduit around the back of the heart. Um, when you get the donor heart, sometimes if you leave the innominate vein intact, you can use that to uh, connect up to the left SVC. But again, because it's a collapsible conduit, it doesn't work as well as the Gore-Tex. Uh, this is a lateral view of the same patient, and you can see that this is the uh, takeoff of the uh, original left SVC, and this is where it ended by the IVC anastomosis. And this is another picture of the same. So organ procurement is never fun for anyone, as you can see, we're all frowning. There's not enough organs. There's not uh, you know, quality organs to go around. Our donors are getting older. They all have intracerebral hemorrhage from hypertension. No more bikers, 18-year-old gunshot wounds. Where are they all gone? Anyways, <laughs> so uh, I guess they're gone now. They, they're gone south, maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah, despite this, we um, coming to the lung part of it, we did do 103 transplants last year, uh, lung transplants. And uh, more of these have been double lung transplants in younger patients. I want to skip this slide. It's taking way too long. And um, as you can see, the most common cause of uh, lung transplants going down is bronchiolitis obliterans. Um, so <laughs> besides the heart heart-lung uh, transplants, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. We've also been doing a, a number of heart-liver transplantations in our, uh, at our Center for Adult Congenital Heart Disease. Uh, liver cirrhosis is the bane of uh, most end-stage end fontans, and they have ascites, they have PLE, and um, a very miserable quality of life. Uh, more recently, our block transplantation has been advocated uh, by the Stanford group, and we are also in, a, uh, uh, in, in the process of in, uh, utilizing it, where you take the entire heart-liver block 
um, with the, a part of the diaphragm and it is implanted into the recipient on cardiopulmonary bypass. The advantage of this is that you avoid a, a, another anastomosis for the IVC, both supra and infrahepatically. There's decreased caudal ischemic time for the liver and uh, allegedly the blood transfusion requirement is the same. Uh, so select cases of uh, heart liver transplants, for instance, with, uh, uh, say, a left-sided IVC or dextrocardia, where the reconstruction is going to be challenging or there's going to be some kinking, this is uh, an indicated indication for this procedure. Uh, again, heart-lung transplantation, their survival is much poorer as compared to heart alone. And if you look at um, the uh, heart liver um, transplantations, you can see how these numbers are in barely in, in double digits. Uh, so the, the most that were done uh, were in 2015, and last year only 18 across the nation uh, were done, heart liver transplants were done, of which I uh, believe three were done at UCLA. So uh, the reason why heart uh, dual, dual organ or multi-organ transplants go down is the weakest organ goes first. And in case of heart lung transplantation, uh, it's usually the lungs uh, that are the cause. And so you can see bronch bronchiolitis obliterans is usually uh, what um, decreases the survivals. Uh, this is our OPTN uh, data for 2017, uh, which shows the results of the heart lung uh, implantations. And you can see, again, the incidence of heart lung transplantation has actually gone down because these uh, results are so poor. Um, finally, last year uh, we did 170 total uh, transplants, heart. Um, uh, 67 hearts and uh, 103 lungs. And so currently we are the biggest transplant program in the nation. We are doing more complex transplants, we're doing retransplantation, multi-organ transplant, and new um, uh, techniques for organ uh, harvesting as well as implantation. So going forward, uh, we're gonna keep getting those medals. <laughs> Thank you very much.